Good evening, everyone. As you can tell, I am not Pastor Chris. He's just getting back from a trip to the Holy Land really early this morning, so he asked me if I would be willing to come and preach to you guys this week. He informed me that since I last preached to you guys about six months ago, the group has doubled, and that I should be prepared to introduce myself. I don't really feel that that's completely necessary, since the only two people here that don't know me well are Colin and Jessica. And they have actually known me for a year now, so the rest of you, some of you have known me for over 20 years, so I don't feel like I really need to introduce myself, but just in case you want some introduction, I'm Ty Summers. I am in my final semester of seminary, hoping to be a pastor soon, and that's probably all you really need to know about me. We're going to discuss some connections after service of how everybody actually knows each other. I really want to thank Adam and Becca for hosting this this week, since I know Chris normally hosts it, but that's kind of difficult for him today. I want I wanted to start off by rereading the message that we've already heard and that we've heard the song for the great is thy faithfulness. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. How many times have many of us heard this or a similar translation? What does hearing this text initially spark in you? What does it call to mind? I know as I hear for the first time, when I start to hear it, I think of how much better it makes me feel about God, how God is going to show me mercy and love. But I also, like several people, like Adam and Dana and Becca here, I get a different con connotation of this because after attending Baker University, where the final version of Grace I Faithfulness was penned, I have some of that sentimental feeling. I heard this song every other week for four years. I have, it brings sentimental things to me. So I realize I'm not probably the best person to discuss this. However, after hearing this so many times and starting to read it in the Bible, I wanted to know what was actually going on because I real, started to realize this is verses 22 and 23. So, there's over 20 verses preceding this. And I feel that these verses are important to give us a context for how it actually applies to modern society. First, I'd like to give you a little bit of background. The author is technically unknown. He's often credited as the prophet Jeremiah, or sometimes called the strong man in several commentaries. This really isn't that important to know. Because how many of the authors do we really know? But it is important to note that this text is written most likely during the Babylonian exile in around the 6th century BCE. This is important because this is likely a couple generations into this exile. So the people are feeling kind of disconnected from their roots. They're in this land that, while it's familiar to them, it's not home. It's not where they feel that they belong. They are kind of suffering identity crisis because of this. Oh, we're supposed to be in Israel, but no, we're stuck in Babylon. I want you to take a moment to think about a time that you felt out of place, like you were not at home. Maybe it's when you first left for school, or you first moved to the big city, started boot camp, or maybe it's when you started your first job at the hospital. With that in mind, how would you feel if you lived your entire life with that feeling? Knowing that, yes, you know where you are, but you don't feel like you belong. It's not going to ever be home. This is a situation for both the writer and the original audience. This is the background of Lamentations. And this is why the verses leading up to 22 and 23 are filled 
with things such in verse 4, with images of God allowing the author's flesh and skin to waste away and his bones to break. And furthermore, the author feels he is the subject of taunting and is a laughing shock to his people in verses 14. How many scholars have even pointed out that the source of torment here seems to be God? How often do we get this feeling that God is putting us through all of this, making us suffer, making us a laughing stock? Well, I guess probably none of you can really relate to that. Come on, none of us have been taunted by God. None of us have been made a laughing stock. Come on, it's not like anybody here has ever battled cancer, been made a laughing stock in front of a group of their friends, maybe asked out a crush and been rejected, or failed an important exam. God, none of us ever go through those kind of situations. But how often do we question God? Why is God allowing this to happen to us? What does it really mean for our lives? If we can't turn to God, who can we trust? I know for me, as I was growing up and experiencing these things, I wanted to question God. I wanted to stop attending church. I wanted to know why God was allowing these physical and mental pains to affect me so much. Luckily, I have been able to get a little bit more understanding with God in these situations, but it doesn't make everything better. That's why these previous images are so important for our hearing of the, the verses that we keep hearing. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. In, in initial reading, I know I wouldn't have felt that these all these verses connect together. Come on, how could being taunted and being made a laughing stock show the love of, of God is steadfast and that the mercies never end? It's important to note that this is fairly common in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament with the meant style of prayer for the authors to complain to God, say that God isn't doing the right things, and then the next verse to be praising God. That's important because it helps us to realize that yes, it's not a problem for us to complain. It's not a problem for us to question God. We just need to realize that we also need to ask, we need to say what is good about God. However, I also realized that through my experiences and the experiences around me, often it's required to have some of these bigger experiences where we don't feel like we got mercy so that we are able to make a new connection or gain a new understanding. As many of you remember, on February 5th last year, on my way to school, there was a weird ice storm moving through Kansas that created ice that nobody was prepared for. Defrosters didn't melt the ice. Windshield wipers couldn't get the ice off fast enough. So as I was driving on the turnpike to school, I had a rollover accident going about 55 to 60 miles per hour, not knowing the road conditions. It would be easy for me to say that I experienced a lot of the same things that the authors of Lamentation experienced. Fear, anger, guilt, embarrassment. How easy would it be for me not to feel God in this situation? And wonder how God could allow this to happen to me. I was on my way to seminary. What more was God asking for me to do at the time? Luckily, even in this period, my mind of my mind racing a mile a minute. I was able to get some clarity and understand that God was showing me mercy. Even though I didn't realize how much mercy I was shown until several days later, really, when I was casually talking to a coworker that happened to be going by about 15 minutes after my accident and had seen the accident scene, he predicted that I probably had rolled over three to four times Think about that, going over three to four times at over 50 miles per hour, I should not have walked away. I should at least have been taken to the hospital in critical condition, most likely. However, I did walk away and I walked away with barely a scratch. 
walked away with some scratches that were maybe an inch, inch and a half, and a bruised left knee. That was God showing me mercy. It could have been my end of times there. I experienced even, I learned of even more of God's mercy about the accident as I was talking to some highway troopers in the area about a week later. And they informed me that there had been many accidents around that time on the turnpike. I think on my way just back from Matfield Green, there were another four or five accidents along the side of the highway, but mine was the most serious accident. And it's important to note that because I'm also the only one that walked away without serious injuries. And the highway troopers pointed out that seeing my accident seemed to make people slow down, go slower on the turnpike that day. And it probably saved other people's lives because while mine was not the only one, it was the most severe. People saw a vehicle rolled over like that that everybody assumed the person was dead. But I was not. This is sadly something that I experience probably more often than a, a lot of other people. I have noticed that I often require a near-death experience to make changes in my life. This is the second time that I've had this serious thing occur. And I'm still learning that I screw up quite often. Luckily, I'm, I often am shown a lot of mercy by God because I am able to walk away from so many of these things without the scratches. The main thing that I walk away with is, is, is the embarrassment, which some people might say is actually a bigger scar, but that's a discussion for later on. Looking at this group, I know that all of us see a lot of mercies every day, especially considering more than half of you work in the emergency room on a daily basis and likely see some pretty horrible things. You see the people after the car accidents. You see the people with overdoses. You see the kids coming in with the flu where the parents don't know whether the kid could survive this because they hear all the stories about how deadly it is for the children. But how often do you get to see these people walk out the door or get the treatment that they require to live. How I know that most of you luckily don't have to see your patients pass away, which I think that's a mercy for most of us. Furthermore, I think that these mercies is something that we all experience even more because, while yeah, we don't often acknowledge them as they're happening, they allow us to change our lives for the better. How many times has one of these experiences caused you to change something in your life? It might be big, like a career change, going back to school, or it could be small, like hugging your children every morning when you used to not do it. I know that these things are important. Often it seems that it's the extreme circumstances where we actually notice the mercies of God. And often these are some of the things that change our lives. I want you to take a moment to just think about what experiences in your life have had the most impact on you, have caused you to experience God or to see a change in your path. If you can't find it that, if you're having issues, think about maybe a test you passed that you hadn't prepared for, or your child making it to the restroom before they got sick. I know that's a big mercy for a lot of us. Maybe walking in the front door before the big storm hits and the rain starts pouring. Or the book you just dropped, missing your toes. I know that one might not seem big, but it's also big to some people. Often these mercies are not acknowledged. They are not attributed to something from God. They're often more attributed to luck. However, 
big or small, all of these mercies do come from God. And I want you to think about that I experience. Um, how often did these little mercies or of the big mercy change your life? How many times did it put you on a new course that you did not expect at the time? That maybe you had made the plans all out for this course, and then you realize that what God just did completely changed your plan. But days later, maybe, you realize the effect that that had on your life, and that what was done actually improved what you, your life in ways that you had not predicted it to be able to. I know that a number of us have experienced a number of these miracle things, these mercies that we had not expected to get. I know that two people in this room had a child when they were just in their teen years. And some people might wonder why I'm calling that a mercy. The mercy is that they both had families that supported having the child in the family didn't want to give it up for adoption. They had the finances to allow both of the people to still, both parents to still attend school, to try to live the normal life. Because you have to remember, because this was before the days of MTV, allowing pregnant parents to become famous and have some financial backing from being a reality star. Furthermore, they got to experience mercy because they got to have a new life brought in that they were responsible for. Yes. This is not something that either of them had planned, but it is probably one of the biggest mercies that we're often shown that we are entrusted to lead further with God's love. All of these mercies, all of this love that God shows us leads to a final question, I think. How often do we want to question God's motives behind giving us all this love and mercy? How often do we feel like we do not deserve it? Why is God showing this to us? The answer seems pretty simple when we look at the text, especially when the God, when the author speaking to God says, Great is thy faithfulness. For me, it is important to recognize that the author is speaking to God in this circumstance. He's not saying, great is my faithfulness. Great is our faithfulness. No, it is great is thy faithfulness. God has enough faith in humans that humans are continually shown love and mercy, no matter how little we deserve it, because God is faithful. Furthermore, a little background helps when in verse 22, the author says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, which in other translations is written as, we are not cut off. Meaning in any other contract, the recipient would be cut off if they do not live up to the expectations that are listed in the contract. However, this is not the way God works. God still tries to reward us even when we screw up. God is faithful in the contract. God is like many parents where even when the child screws up they want to renegotiate the contract to give the child another chance to give the child a way to grow because god realizes that our failures is where we learn how off how many times do we hear you do not learn from success you learn from the failures i think that's what god likes to show us that we are loved so much that God will give us these extra chances. We are we are never going to live up to all the conditions that are in the contract with God, but God is willing to negotiate that contract to still give us the rewards that God feels we deserve. I think this is why Thomas Chisholm chose to write the lyrics for this hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It is to help us remember in good times and bad, God's love is present, and God is faithful. No matter how often we mess up, God will show us the mercies that allow us to get back up and are will as long as we are willing 
to accept the mercies and to recognize them. We are just asked to accept God's love and mercy because God's faithfulness in us is great. We will never deserve it. And that's what I believe.